All right, let's get started then. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in to our today's DevSecOps Live. I represent Practical DevSecOps, as most of you know. Some of you mentioned that you've been following Practical DevSecOps or you've interacted with us earlier in some way or the other. My full name is it's Maru Dumarin Gunashekaran. I'm talking to you from Bangalore, India today. We're a remote first company, Practical DevSecOps, go by Marin in short. And at the moment, the cadence for DevSecOps Live happens to be every month. Uh, the last Thursday of the month, today is last Thursday. Uh, the Thursday of the previous month, we did an episode about doing DevSecOps in Azure. And the previous episode was about how you can learn open policy agent or policy as code without losing your mind. Uh, we're still yet to upload those videos to our YouTube channel, hopefully together with today's talk, which is bringing dev and sec together with interactive code maps. We should be able to get that done. So the webinar is being recorded as we speak and the videos will be made available later in our YouTube channel. And if you're subscribed to our newsletter, you'd find it there. If you're subscribed to our LinkedIn and Twitter feed, you'd find that there as well. So practical DevSecOps, you'd like to keep things practical. And we know that DevSecOps is more than tooling, more than automation. Uh, we, get, we got to get people working together into a certain aspects of culture. And when we talk about culture and people working together, communication becomes very obvious. And this was one of the interesting talk, talks that I stumbled upon bringing Dev and Sec together with interactive code maps. And I, in particular, was very curious about this topic. So we reached out to the founders and the creators of the tool itself, and they were courteous enough to come over here to our DevSecOps Live and present what the tool entails. So with that, I'd like to introduce Kevin Mr. Kevin Gilpin, who is the Chief Technology Officer and the co-founder at Appland. We have some nice demonstrations to see uh, what Appland and the tool itself is all about. I will stop sharing my screen, so I will let Kevin take over from now on. Kevin, if you feel the need to introduce yourself, feel free to do so. Okay, um, thank you. Um, and first of all, you know, I appreciate everybody choosing to spend their time with us today. Um, you know, everybody has has a lot to do, and you know, it's it's great to see uh, everybody coming. And so, you know, I feel like I certainly owe it to everyone here to make this time as useful as possible. So, I will um, keep my eye on the chat, you know, as much as possible. And you know, this this is for you, so don't don't hesitate to to say something. Um, we. Uh, interactive code maps is our is our subject today. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that um, you know. So Appland is a startup, and it's actually the um, second startup that I've done that's um, at least partly in the DevSecOps space. The previous one was called Conjure, which was a uh, or is a um, sort of machine identity and secrets manager for cloud. And we started that in 2012 and Conjure is now owned and operated by CyberArk, um, which is a public uh, cybersecurity company from, from Israel and, New and Newton, Massachusetts. We're based in, um, in the Boston area also. So there's a lot of you know, cybersecurity activity here. Um, and you know, one of the things we learned a lot about at Conjure was about um, make you know how to build a tool that multiple different types of people in different jobs could use at the same time. Um, because for secrets management, you have cybersecurity people who need to ensure the the security and, and integrity of keys in the cloud. You had developers who were deploying applications and needed to get secrets and um, Make do things like make database connections and you know make cloud API calls, and then there were the, the operators who needed to deploy and, and manage the infrastructure. So Conjure had kind of interface handles for each of those different groups of people, 
Um, and essentially they each looked at Conjure like it was a different product almost because their jobs were so different, but you know, it had to um, perform a function uh, and enable everyone to work together. So um, Appland is, is very different because it's really about um, software understanding um, and kind of observability of code and um, not specifically focused on DevSecOps, um, but really rather on the whole problem of communication and collaboration about code between all the people who interface with code. And of course, you know, um, that includes again, developers, security, operators, testers. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we still have our, all our, old, our friends in security from, from Conjure. And when we talked to them about what we were doing, they said, you know, one of the big uh, issues we have in, in DevSecOps right now is that um, when we are pen testing and we find an issue, then um, it can be difficult to like actually explain to developers what specifically we were doing when we when we found the problem. And developers also, they want a test case so that they can, because their process is that the fix isn't, isn't done until there's a test case available. And so, um, you know, there's, there's kind of a disconnect there because the security folks doing the pen testing, they've seen the problem. They see the, the severity of the issue. Developers are looking at it along with all the other stuff in their queue, you know, features and bugs and all this other stuff. And they're saying, if it's not really that easy for me to reproduce what you've, what you found and create a test case, then I have to tell my, you know, when, when we're sort of estimating how much work this is, it looks like a lot of work. And so it's hard for me to just bang it out. You know, it's like, a, it looks like a difficult task. So the more clear that the knowledge transfer can be from like a pen tester who finds a problem to reporting it to a developer, the easier it is for them to take it on, then it gets fixed, gets resolved, you know, so that's, that's really better for everyone. So um, that of course is the case for, for any, you know, issue that, that developers take on, the better described it is, um, the more context they have, the more clear it is what they're supposed to do and what the acceptance criteria is, you know, the easier it is for them to work on and the faster it's going to get, get done and resolved. So, um, but that's, that's kind of a very developer way of looking at things. And from a security standpoint, you're just like, hey, I found this security problem in your app and it's pretty important, you know, how can you, how can you be saying that it's not like gonna get fixed soon, you know? So what we're talking about here is just providing some um, kind, of a, kind of a blueprint here for using, let me turn my screen sharing on because we'll jump into, the presentation in a second, um, you know, using using this tool that we've developed, which is open source, um, and so it's really community developed. Um, there's nothing I'm going to show you here today that you have to buy. Um, our goal is to you know bring this bring this um, new kind of approach into into the software development lifecycle so that we can smooth out some of these inefficiencies and like enable people to, to work together. And of course, this talk is specifically about DevSecOps, but we also, you know, um, function like more broadly in like other parts of development. Um, but I'll try and keep it, you know, on, on topic as much as possible for, for DevSecOps. So I've been talking about this, you know, you've got this room full of people and this guy's got a migraine and, you know, they've got this problem and, this is just they, they could be they could be working on anything, but let's let's call it a bug or, or a security issue. Um, and they've got they've got their whiteboard with scribbles all over it, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And just acquiring knowledge about code is is difficult, and communicating about it is difficult too, especially when some people in the room are like more familiar or expert with software development and the code. Other people are more familiar with like project management or security and like getting everybody on the same page is, is really important. And 
the less the less information um, and clarity that developers have about about a problem, the longer it takes them to to work on it. So that's that's one of the reasons you know that's 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 really driving the need for better code understanding tools. Um, let's see. I don't have the. I've lost like the chat window, but just interrupt me if there's a if there's a question. I, I, should I will. I will definitely, Kevin. Okay, cool. Um, so I covered a lot of this already, um, and so I'll probably just jump on to the next one. Um, actually, there's a typo in the in my dev2 link. It's actually dev.2 slash k g i l p i n. Um, but we are like active there in blogging. So if you want like more information, and I'll have links, plenty of links at the end of the talk that you can that you can check out. So um, this, you know, this talk I've sort of set the table, and it's going to be really rooted in an, an example, and I'll be demoing um, real soon how to, uh, you know, live for you. So it's going to be it's going to be oriented around this particular example, and it's really about the communication and information handoff during the life cycle of a of a bug uh, or security fix. So you have three different people who are needing to communicate and work together to get the issue found uh, fixed. The person who's reporting the problem, in this case, it's like a security issue. There's a developer who picks up that that issue or ticket and is going to fix it. And then there's the code reviewer. And at each phase, you have someone who's got to like learn a lot about what's going on here. Um, the, the, the pen tester, you know, may not have used the app before, not that familiar with it. A lot of the time, um, you know, maybe you're working on a contract and it's a whole new company that your platform that you're working with, or it's a new app to you. The developer, you might assume they're familiar with the app, but they may not be. They may be new to the project. They may be new to the company. You know, it's it's frequently the case that there's a lot of knowledge ramp up the developer needs to do, and then um, before that fix is going to get approved and pulled in to the to the official code base for release, another developer needs to look at it and review it. And this person also may not be that familiar with with what's going on. So um, there's a lot of uh, sort of code understanding that needs to that needs to happen here. So um, just to go through each of those those participants in the process, the first the first participant is going to be um, what we'll call like the bug reporter or the bug finder. This is someone who's using the app and sees a flaw. They don't necessarily know a ton about how the app works, or even you know about coding in general, but that's not that's not their role. Their role is to know what to look for and identify when when there are flaws. Um, when they find something, they need to uh, communicate that to the to the dev team. And if it's a purely a visual issue, um, then maybe a screenshot is a good way to to figure out you know, or communicate what happened. But what happens when the bug is really more about backend behavior, like um, the user gets inaccurate information or they see data that's belonging to someone else or really should be hidden, um, or they expect to go to one page, but they end up on another page. When the bug is like really to do with the internals of the backend, then, you know, a screenshot isn't, isn't always that helpful. So, what we're proposing here, what I'll, what I'll show you um, is a way for when you find a bug to actually include like a map or a screenshot, if you will. Um, some, someone here at Appling calls it the front end for your back end that shows you visually what happened in the code in the back end. And so that answers all the developers questions about, about where they need to go to find the problem and reproduce it. And it also essentially is a big head start towards making a test case because they'll see the route, they'll see the parameters, you know, assuming it's a web app, they'll see the queries. And that's like 
most of what the developer needs to like reproduce and and test the problem. So I'll show you how how that can work too. So that's our concept: the app map, the the front end for for your back end. Um, code observability is like another kind of buzzword that's coming up now to explain, you know, or or capture this idea of being able to. Um, understand code in other ways besides just going to the source code and, and reading it, um, which is, you know, always going to be an important way of interacting with the code. But if you're a, if you're a pen tester and you're reporting a bug, you're not going to be going into the code base and identifying for the developer what line of code the bug is happening on. Like that's, that's their job to figure out. Um, but the more you can help them figure that out by providing as much information and context in the, in the issue, the better. So that's what we'll do um, with app maps. All right, so that's, that's kind of setting the table. I'll be, I'll be playing those three roles, the bug finder, the developer, the, the code reviewer, and showing them how, and show you kind of how these code maps can help transfer knowledge and, and just help everyone work efficiently as they go through this, this process. So there's my calendar. Um, I'm going to use this app here, which is called the rail sample app. Um, and it kind of works like a Twitter clone. So you can be like, hello there. I'm logged in as this example user. There's other users in the system. Um, this is, of course, using test data. Um, and you can follow other users. So I'm like following this user, user 19. And if I go to their page, I can see, I can see all of their tweets. And you know, that seems pretty, pretty, pretty reasonable for a for a Twitter style app. But um, Oh, there's a little message. But, um, you know, let's say I'm looking at this app for security flaws, and this is a real example. The Rails sample app is a really popular um, tutorial for like learning Ruby on Rails. And what we noticed is I'll save this URL, URL here by copying it. Okay, just checking the chat window. Um, so if I log out, this is, you know, what an app usually looks like when you're not logged in. But if I go back to that user page I was looking at, um, I'm still not logged in, but I can see all this data. So um, that seems to me like a security problem. I'm going to report this as a bug and say, hey, you know, in order to see this, this user data, the users like, you know, tweets, uh, I should be required to be logged in because otherwise this information can all be like scraped by bots or what have you. So I've created an issue over here in the, in the GitHub repo. Um, and it says, um, I want to forbid anonymous access to the user page. So um, great. If I were to submit, you know, just this, this is this is not not a great amount of, of detail to provide to the development team about what to do. So what I'm going to do um, is create one of these code maps that I was talking about, um, which is uh, going to be maps of the back end as the bug is is happening. So I have this little um, Appland browser extension. Um, you can find everything that I'm going to use here, by the way, on appland.com slash docs. Um, so like the browser extension is, is over here if you want to try it and get it. Um, and it's super simple. I'll just push record. And then I'll refresh this page. Um, so I've performed the user action. The code is traversed all through the um, code paths in the back end. And then I'll come up here and say, stop recording. And then it's going to pop open this website at, at Map Cloud. And what it's done is 
create this recording of, of the back end. And it's available in, in two views. One of them is a dependency map that shows how the components like web services to code to the database um, all work together. And the other view is called a trace view, which is like got even more detail and, and things like function parameters and things. But for purposes of like reporting, reporting the issue, like that doesn't really matter. Um, I don't need to get all into, you know, understanding of this. I'm providing it um, like I would a screenshot. So I'll copy this URL and go over here. Um, put this link into the bug report. And then just to be extra helpful for the dev team, I'll say, you know, here's what I, here's what I expected it to do. So I'll log in as myself. If I go to like, um, actually I meant to be logged out. So if I go to like the followers link, it is going to redirect me to the login page. So followers is login protected, and that's what I want. That's what I want the the other page to be as well. So I'll start a recording, click on followers. It's redirecting me to the login page, and I'll capture this one and do the same thing here. Um, copy that link, put it over here in my issue and say, all right, I wanna forbid, I think you should really forbid access to the user page without a login. Um, here's, a, here's a code map showing the current behavior. There's another code map showing the behavior that I, that I wanna see. And this goes over to the dev team, right? As a, as a tester, I'm done reporting the issue. So now I'll kind of switch roles, um, change my hat or shirt or something. And now I'm now I'm the developer. I'm picking up this issue. So you know we've done our we've done our bug triage and whatnot. And hey, this issue like looks important. There's lots of detail here. This looks like something I could you know take action on right away. So let me let me get over here into my code editor. So I'm in VS Code. I have this app map extension for VS Code. And um, Kevin, I have a small request. Uh, yeah. One of the one of the participants apparently has troubles viewing the screen share. So can I ask you to stop screen sharing and restart it? See if that fixes for him. It's a, it's a sure. request. All right, that is stopped. Yep. And I'll just start it again. Okay, I, I see your screen. We're good to go. We tried. Okay. Thank you. We tried. I hope it works. Um, okay, so now I'm the developer. Um, so let me start with this with this first app map. Um, I've pulled these down from, from the website, like into my code editor. And the first, the first code map says, um, this is the user page. Um, the user is viewing the user page with this URL, get user slash ID, um, which is a pretty, pretty standard looking type URL route. Um, and so I can see the code and the relationships um, and which code is, is relevant to the bug. So as I showed briefly before, the first view here is the um, is a dependency map that shows me all the code that's involved. If I click on like the database icon, I can see all the SQL queries that happened. And from any one of these, I can also like jump down into this into this trace view, which includes um, parameters like the user ID, the response, like the mind type and the status, some timing information, so I know how long everything took. Um, and as a developer, now I'm getting now I'm getting into the code, and I can see that um, 
the request was handled by this users controller. And I can pop open the source code of that. And it's the request flows through this show method. So if I'm going to enforce the login, like this is where it's going to, this is where it's going to need to go. That's my first, first bit of info. My second bit of info will be coming from the other app map um, that showed the behavior like as desired, right? So in this case, I can see like there's an authentication label here. I'll click on that. Um, and I can see that this page, again, this is the one that required the login, um, went through this function called logged in helper, logged in user. So if I go up here, logged in user, users controller. This is the same, the same code that I was in before. And I can see that there's already, already this function called logged in user that's being applied to a bunch of different actions, but not to the, not to the show action. So this is a pretty standard way of doing this kind of thing with Rails. So I'll add the show function here to the list of methods that requires login. And um, then as I mentioned, like as a as a professional developer, this is not finished until I've tested it. Right. So let's see how that can work. I'll run this test um, command called bundle exec rake app map, which is going to rerun the tests. It figures out which code has been modified um, and needs to be retested. And it turns out there's a test case here that says, while you're anonymous, you can see the user page. Um, and that isn't true anymore because I've changed it. So instead of a 200 code, it should be a 302, 302 redirect status. And I'll come down here and add this test, which of course I've already got in here because you don't want me to type all this in. Um, but now I have to log in first, then I get the user page, then I get the 200 status. So I can now rerun my test cases. Um, oops. And now it'll go through everything, and um, I'll be demonstrating not only that the that the code behavior has changed, but also that I've added a test for the new um, correct behavior. There's another. Uh, so yeah, let me just let me just pause there. Um, if I go over here and show the code diff, this is basically what I would submit. Um, as a as a pull request, so that my code reviewer would accept the change, they would see the the filter that I added here to require login. They would see the changes that I made to the test case, and then they would also see this file here, Open API underscore stable. So Open API is an is an interesting thing. Open API is this format here, which is in YAML. And what it does is it lists all the web service routes that are um, made available by the application. So this is the get method under users ID, which gets a single user. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of more stuff in here, which I won't scroll around through it. But suffice it to say this app, um, exposes a whole bunch of different web services. And so when I make a pull request, like it can be unclear what exactly it is I'm changing about the web services API. Web services APIs are super important because they are the way that all the user requests come in and out of the app. Um, they're the vector for all kinds of like security issues. Um, if there are, if there's other application client code that is going to be interacting with this app, then as I make changes to the web service API, 
I have to be very conscious of like, am I breaking any of my clients and introducing problems that would not show up until there's an integration test, if there even is one between this app and that client, or maybe it goes out into production and, and things break there. So, you know, web services, the web services API, like the database, these are two uh, really important, you know, interfaces uh, to understand about the application. So having this open API file here that really makes this change pop out, right? It says, hey, the one thing you really need to know about this change in the code is that I've introduced a new, um, a new status, a new mode for this, for this, for this function. So it's not buried in a code change where you have to understand that by adding that, you know, this little before action that I've now introduced a 302 status code. Like that's not obvious at all from looking at this code change. So when we talk about code maps, we're talking about not just visual code maps, but, you know, presentations of the behavior of the app that make it really evident and obvious what types of changes are being made in the code. Because if you ask your code reviewer to do kind of mental gymnastics with like reading your code and trying to figure out what the new behavior is, like, you know, that's hard. Uh, make it easy for people. I'm, I'm a big believer in that. Um, there's, there's, no, there's no shame in that. I don't, I, don't need to, um, I don't need to show people that I can, you know, reverse engineer what their code is gonna do. Like, just, just show me, just make it obvious. So now when I push this, you know, pull requests with the app maps and the, and the diff of the code and the open API diff, that's gonna give the reviewer lots of information about what the new code change does. Um, and why, and so that handoff is complete from the security issue found by the pen tester to the report. I was able to consume that as a developer, isolate what I needed to do, and now I'm communicating downstream um, to make it easy for this, this code to get merged. So that's really what it's all about, right? Is making it, just making it easier for people. If you go back to that, picture in the very beginning with the people at the whiteboard and they're just stressed out and like that's what you don't want um not you know not only is that an unhappy place to be and stressful but with that with that amount of uncertainty and confusion it's also likely that you know the right solution may not even get implemented at all it's it's very common for people to have a misunderstanding about how code is working or what actually needs to be done. Um, and, you know, watching, watching big companies and small companies working on trying to manage and maintain like big monolithic apps or microservices apps where you have lots of different pieces and their interfaces are always changing. That's why I showed you the, the open API snippet, right? Um, that's what really prompted us at Appland to start working on this problem in the first place is to try to just cut through that noise, make it more e easy and obvious what's going on in the code um, and reduce that incidence of those migraine headaches and crazy whiteboard sessions. So this is some, some info about um, how to get started with that map. Appland.com slash docs is also great. That's probably all you really need to know. Um, if you're working on this purely from the SEC side, then your dev team would add the Ruby agent or Python agent or Java agent to their code and provide some configuration. And then when you are testing the code in, in, your, in the environment that's created for you to pen test, then you would be able to use that browser extension to record the things that you see and want to report. And I really think the development team will, will, be, will be thrilled if you can provide them with that, that detail when you make a report. Um, so here's, here's a few more, few more links. Um, where our blog is super active um, and we do talk about you know, bugs and security and collaboration uh, all the time. 
And as I mentioned back in the beginning, um, App, AppLine is an open source company. Discord, this Discord URL is um, free for anyone to join. We have channels for each of the different um, languages that we support, as well as things like security um, announcements and stuff like that. So we have uh, a lot of really um, obviously cool things coming down the pike um, and we're constantly looking for people to talk with us about, about how to make it better. And I mean, that's, that's not just lip service. Like we, we talk all the time um, in, in Appland about how to outreach to people, how to find out um, how our app is landing with people, how they're using it, how they can make it better. Um, that's, that's really our DNA. So um, would love to, to be able to, you know, interact with some of you folks um, at, any, at any time. And these are a bunch of good ways to do that. So that's, that's what I've got here in terms of presentation content. And so I will hand it back to probably our host. There is a question. There is a question Well, and a comment as well, a great presentation. Well, I'll go one by one. Uh, Ravi okay. is asked, oh, you could, could you also see them in, in the chat, Kevin? Yeah. Well, well, if you do, then can I request you to read those out and try and take a stab at them? Okay. Um, so I tried it, but examples are tied with the test stage. Is there a way we can ignore the tests um, and then produce app maps? So I think I, think I maybe get this. Um, there's there's a lot of information in our documentation and videos about how to record app maps from test cases. And that's super relevant for developers who wanna characterize their app automatically all in one go. Um, but you know, for, for recording something like a, like a security bug, like using the browser extension and just getting that recording as you click through the app, that's that's really the way to go. Um, okay, uh, this can be used by bug bounty hunters to traverse through the code using the browser extension. Is this a negative use case? And there are any controls to prevent this if it happens? Um, yeah. So you know up. App map is really designed to be used by, um, you know, people who are trusted and members of the members of the team. Um, we do get so you know this would be like in your dev environment, in your in your test test environment. You know, if you're pen testing, you'll be in an environment that's like set up for you. Um, if 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 someone does you know manage to get in there, like that's not. They're not they're not accessing production data, so um, that's 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 a safeguard. This isn't something that you would put out um, in this form in production. But we are actually really interested in capturing um, capturing data from production, not in a way that that users can access it, but just kind of invisibly in the background. Um, that data could potentially be used for looking for penetration, you know, attempts or weaknesses, or it can also just be used to say, hey, there are, because that map can map these code paths in so much detail, maybe there are um, code paths that are important in production and not actually covered by any, by any QA or, or testing. So that's information that would come back to the development team and tell them that there's a disconnect between their what they're testing and how their app is actually being used. So, um, but for the you know for the purposes of pen testing, we would be you know the way this is being used now is that it's being used by trusted users in a in an environment that's set up for for testing. Right. Thank you for your questions, Samir and Ravi. Anybody else? Any other questions? What other questions do we have? 
I wonder, Kevin, what is the connection between the agent that is going to run on the web server that was, was running on localhost, right? The connection between that agent and the web browser extension, can they be used independently or are they related and work together in some way to produce those insights that, was, that were provided? Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So when you, when you run the agent in your app, um, and if it's a Java app, it's a Java agent. If it's a Python or Ruby app, it's a, it's a gem or library. Um, you can enable that um, your application um, to basically accept HTTP messages that say start recording or stop recording. So it's, we call it remote recording because it's a remote way to begin or end a recording. So the browser, you know, you can, you can even do this in like the Chrome debugger or whatever. When you push the start recording button, it sends an HTTP message to your app, which is intercepted and processed by the app map agent that begins recording. So the browser extension is, is one way of doing recording. Um, we also have buttons like if you're using, if you're a developer and you're using the app map extension in your code editor, you can start and stop, make recordings there. You can use curl. We had uh, some security people who essentially wrapped the uh, wrapped everything in their own bash, interactive bash terminal, where it would like send curl requests and pull things out and stick them in files, you know, because um, they were like super command line oriented people. So, you know, it's programmable, it's open, people do, people do interesting things with it. And that's the kind of thing where it's great to hear back from people about what they're doing out there in the wild, and especially if there's something we can do to, to make it easier. Okay, thanks, that, that, answers, the, that answers the question. So uh, it kind of popped up because of the bug bounty question and looking at the, the way bug bounty programs work these days, you really need to have this agent installed on the server in order for you to enable communication between the browser add-on and to get the code maps visually, correct? So. In, in, in yeah. a white box penetration, in a, in a white box vulnerability assessment scenario, when you are brought in as a security professional to perform some kind of vulnerability assessment on the application, then installing this agent on the web server is only going to provide a greater insights and greater communication through all the different ways that you've showed. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. So. Right. Without the agent, and you know, installed and activated like that, that that vector isn't isn't there for for better or for worse. Yeah. Great. Well, which also kind of reminds me of the interactive application security testing technologies, acronymed as the IASD, or the other version, uh, RASP, real time application self protection. They have this agent. Run. So we have we we've had the static analysis solutions before that would just scan the source code and then would tell you where a SQL injection or a cross site scripting is. On the other end of the spectrum, we've had dynamic application security testing tools that tested the application after it is deployed using the URLs. But in the, in, in the past five or six years, they're having this new thing. Someone, uh, Ravi also asked in the chat about binary instrumentation. So this is closely aligned towards that path. Do we have any goals of pursuing in, in, in the direction of the application security testing space, because we now have the technology that interacts with the code as well as the running application. And we have greater insights in terms of where the data is traversing through. Is that something that uh, on, on the radar? Um, you know, it's the most interesting thing that's been happening with us with like dedicated security companies is, is really more of like a partnership where if, if there's a tool that like say detects or intercepts like a flaw um, or an attack on the application that then like AppMap can provide like a detailed picture of everything that happened like in, in the code. Um, we also, I showed you the, the open API stuff. So there are some tools that perform um, 
testing of the application. And the first thing they want to do is ingest the open API so they know all the routes to exercise. So that means they're dependent on the app having an open API file, which many of them don't. So the fact that we can like generate one of those for any app just by using it, then that enables their pen testing, their tool to actually work on apps that it wouldn't otherwise work on. So, you know, there's there's cool opportunities to make these tools work together um, and just improve the efficiency of this process for everybody. Great to hear that. All right, um, question from participants, anybody? What other questions do we have for the presenter today? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself now. I'm not sure if you have the permission, but please type them in chat. Well, okay, if there aren't any questions at this time, you could definitely, oh, there's, there's one in the Q&A. Would, would like to know how effective do you think RASP solutions are in comparison to DASD? Uh, okay, could I? Kevin, would you like to take a stab at it? Uh. <laughs> Did you have thoughts on that one? This is like- right, Sure, 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 yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I was also thinking. Uh, well, obviously RASP solutions are expensive compared to the DAST solutions because you know they have the additional advantage of looking at your source code and the running version of the application. Yeah. RASP, the RASP solutions also try and prevent your threats, right? If you compare and contrast that to the, the to the firewall systems that still exist at the network level, yeah, firewall the systems firewall operate, yeah. operate in two modes, right? Intrusion detection. So int intrusion is detected and alerted, and there's also intrusion prevention systems. So besides detection, intrusions can also be prevented, right? And, and in a similar fashion, RASP solutions work in two modes, report only mode, and blocking mode. So in that way, dynamic application security testing solutions help you in testing your application after it is deployed. But real-time application self-protection systems run alongside your application in production. They can not only detect threats, but they can also help you prevent threats there. That, that's my take on how effective RASP solution is in comparison to DASD. Yes, yeah, so that's a great case. So if you have your third party application or a component where you don't control the code, uh, people normally resort to virtual patching. Uh, if virtual patching is a jargon, if you don't control the code, you can't fix it. You gotta wait for the third party developer to give you an update there. Mm -hmm. And if, if the third party components are not actively maintained, then you gotta fix that yourself or some people turn to web application firewall solutions to enable, so to enable particular rules that the web application firewall will detect the vulnerability in that third party code. And then the web application firewall would be able to prevent it. So in that case, definitely RASP is a great solution there. Yep, I, I agree with you um, and not, not to, uh not to come in on the, the side of one or the other. Um, but one thing we track pretty closely is the, the common weaknesses enumeration from MITRE. And that's an interesting resource because they look at all kinds of different vulnerabilities, everything from your standard like buffer overflow type stuff to, um, you know, real code design issues like, um, you know, the one that we saw in the demo where it's like, there's nothing statically detectable there. It's really just a sort of wrong behavior or inappropriate behavior on the part of the application. In that case, basically failure to authenticate a user to a, to a particular route. Um, and so they have, a, they have a lot of, they actually have kind of organized these, these weaknesses by 
um, which tools are capable of uncovering them. Um, and so it's an interesting place to go look when you're thinking about what, you know, which, which technique is better than the other. It's like any security question. It's like, what's the threat model, right? What are you worried about? Um, so, you know, they all, they all have their, they all have their pluses and minuses. You know, I know like, um, with Conjure, because it was running in the production environment of our customers, a huge consideration was like, are you ever going to interfere with the uptime or performance of the applications? You know, if you said, well, our tool is only 5% overhead, they'd be like, you can stop right there because 5% is way too high, right? So things that test your app before you deploy it, don't add overhead, that's a plus. Things that run in line with your app are, are, are an active protection, but there's, there's going to be an overhead and web application firewalls introduce like configuration complexity and things like that. So, you know, we, this, this, the CWE is just a really interesting, like unbiased. Then, then you go read like vendor stuff and of course, like their stuff is the best, right? So finding like, you know, unbiased sources like this one, like this podcast and things, it's like what you got to, what you got to seek out to, to make your own decision. Cause there isn't like, if this is better than that, it's all, it's all trade-offs. Very true. Great insights there. I got, I got a question for everybody who is in the attendee list today. What, what other future topics would you like to hear going forward in the future of DevSecOps live events? Uh, feel free to put that on the chat as well. Uh, while you guys do that, I appreciate Kevin and Lizzie for being kind enough to attend as speakers and presenters at our DevSecOps Live event today. I hope that most of you or everybody found that this particular presentation useful. We're consulting a couple of organizations right now, so I'd be sure to recommend them to look at Outland and then see what they could benefit in terms of security communications at least. Other than that, uh, well, thank you, Kevin and Lizzie, for being here today. Our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Great. So um, the sessions are being recorded. I'll notify you guys once uh, we upload it to our YouTube channel. Other than that, uh, it's, it's been great. I personally enjoyed this talk. I've, I've had a lot of questions, but some of them have, were answered in the slide as we went through the presentation. <laughs> some of them were asked by the audience themselves as well. Um, I wish everybody have a good evening and have a good day. Thank you for tuning in today. There's one last question from Rohini again. We will take that. Can we cover microservices architecture? Well, I'm going to answer that as a definite yes, but I will leave leave it to Kevin as well. <laughs> yeah, microservices architecture is is a really hot area um, for us in particular because being able to see how requests flow um, through those through those hops within a microservices. Um, system and being able to essentially correlate code maps together so that where one code map sends out a request then it, you can pick it up on the other side um, and be able to see root cause of an issue. Um, I mean, a personal story, like we were, my wife and I were trying to get our cell phone plan changed through a non, yeah, phone vendor that I won't name. Um, and at one point as the we were, they were like, well, we need to reset your account or change your password or something. Then we were just completely locked out because as we went to the login screen, it was just redirecting us around and around in circles until like finally like the browser would just like time out, right? So issues like that that happen within applications are, are super hard to debug. Um, and so having like, having the insight of code maps that can really trace through these requests from one end to another, um, we think that's gonna be really huge for us. And partly because of our ability to get like the deep insight and the data, and partly because of our ability to deliver that information 
into the development environment where, where development can really act on it. Um, a lot of microservices like observability tools are really oriented around providing uptime information for operators. And if there's a problem as a developer, you get some logs and, and network traces, but it's not a it's not a developer native experience and it's definitely not a security, you know, or or pen testing native experience either. So I think there's there's a real need there. Like so many other things like microservices has has tons of benefits, but it's also created a lot of need for new tools that will work better within that environment. Um, so that's a real active area for us and watch our blog, I guess I would say. Well, I have lots to say about that. Oh, all right. Great. Well, uh, a little bit of heads up, our next, uh, okay, I believe we're out of time in the last webinar. We just still cover them in the next what I believe we're out of time in the last webinar. Yes, of course, Ravi. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, doing some demonstrations the last webinar. We skipped some topics. We will definitely line them up in the future. As for the next webinar itself, we're planning to bring somebody and talk about API security in particular. Uh, that's what's next. But we will definitely address the topics that were left uncovered in the future webinars. Thank you for the reminder there. Uh, I see Appland as a tool with great potential to help security professionals at least, well, besides other things, besides other professionals and communicating security bugs with developers. Uh, it, it's kind of hard. Uh, it used to be hard at least before Appland, I guess. And we will try and recommend this to a lot of our security professionals as well. And uh, I wish Kevin and his team good luck in taking this tool to greater heights. With that, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in today. Watch out for updates about our next event, and have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.